بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we are now uh, still on the Battle of Badr. Uh, last week we had talked about the preparations for the Battle of Badr uh, and why it is called the Battle of Badr. Who can remind me why is it called the Battle of Badr? The, it's a person's name, the person who dug a well at a particular place and that place was then called after the well. Uh, and this is which Battle of Badr? The first, the second, the third? No, this is not Sughra, this is Kubra, this is the big one, this is the second battle of Badr, this is the big, this is the real battle of Badr, the other battle of Badr is not even quite a battle, it was just a minor skirmish as we had mentioned. Now, uh, we had mentioned that Abu Sufyan detected uh, the presence of the Prophet and he took an alternate route, uh, going closer to the shore, closer to the, uh, the, 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 the Red Sea, and he sent uh, uh, an envoy, a crier to Mecca, to hype up the people of the Quraysh to send an army. So what happened after the dream of Atiqah, we had mentioned the dream of Atiqah, we had mentioned uh, the commotion that had been caused by Abu Jahl and by uh, uh, Al-Abbas and what happened over there. What happened after that? The Quraysh immediately convened a council and they're debating what exactly needs to be done. And almost unanimously, they agreed they need to send an army to protect the caravan. Because the exaggerated report of Lamdam, the exaggerated report of the envoy of Abu Sufyan had made them very worried about their investments. This is their livelihood, this is their saving. There's simply no question that this in their eyes is a legitimate army. That they need to gather together an army immediately and send it out to, co to confront the, uh, the Muslims. And therefore the largest and the quickest gathering ever in the history of Mecca took place in that they gathered together uh, the largest quantity of people in the smallest amount of time. That literally within a day, preparations were completed and they left uh, Mecca. And a number of incidents occurred, and again we're trying to piece this together to make a, a fluid narrative. A number of, of incidents occurred. It is said by Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq mentions that not a single family in Mecca remained behind except that somebody was sent on behalf of that family. Every single household sent somebody. And this is uh, a prediction of the dream of Atika. Because what was dream, the dream of Atika? That every household, a rock would hit it. Right? And in prediction of that dream, what happened? Every household was uh, sending a person, an emissary, and if they could not send an emissary, uh, if they couldn't send somebody from within the household, they hired another person to send. They hired another person to, to, to go in his place, and a number of specific incidents are mentioned by a number of people about what happened here. So, we know a number of things that occurred. Firstly, Abu Lahab himself, who is Abu Lahab? Of course, he's the uncle of the Prophet He's also the chieftain of the Banu Hashim. Abu Lahab decided not to go. And instead, he found somebody to go in his place. And this person, uh, his name is known, Al uh, 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 his name is known, uh, Al Asa bin Wa'il, uh, that he hired, he didn't hire, sorry, he didn't hire somebody. Uh, he didn't hire somebody. He actually had a loan, an outstanding loan of 4,000 dirhams that was owed to him. And so he told this debtor that if you go in my place, I'll forgive the loan for you. 4,000 dirhams is a large amount of money. If you go in my place, I will uh, forgive this large amount for you. And so this person went in his stead and Abu Lahab did not go. Now it is not mentioned why Abu Lahab did not uh, go. It, this, this is not mentioned in the classical books as far as I could find. Uh, but Allah knows best, perhaps along with the natural fear and cowardice of, of meeting an enemy and of being killed, Allah knows best there was also probably a sense of conflict. There was a sense of personal conflict that in the end of the day, this is his sub-tribe that he will be fighting. And this goes against everything that the Arabs stood for. The Jahili paganism, the Jahili uh, system of tribalism, that in the end, he could not meet his own tribe in battle. Because after all, most of the, the Prophet himself is Banu Hashim, that's his nephew. Uh, the majority of the Muslims uh, of the Quraysh are from uh, the tribe and related to him. And therefore, perhaps he did feel some conflict and in fact, Throughout the seerah, even though, of course, Abu Lahab is not worthy of any praise, 
and Allah curses him in the Quran. Nonetheless, we find that Abu Lahab, on a few occasions, did do certain things of nobility according to his custom, not according to Islam, according to his custom. And of them, as you remember, who can remind me one or two things that Abu Lahab did that uh, were of nobility? He sacrificed when the Prophet was born, that he was so happy that he. Uh, s sacrifice freed the slave and he sacrificed an udhiyah and because of this the Prophet ﷺ said he's given just a little bit of water every week he's given a little bit of water uh, because of this right and what else did he do who, who can remind me he initially protected the Prophet, protected the Prophet ﷺ after the death of Abu Talib. Abu Talib after the death of Abu Talib Abu Lahab became the de facto leader of the Quraysh or of the Banu Hashim to be more precise. And despite all that happened, he said, you know what, since in the end of the day he is my tribe, he is my nephew, I guess I'll have to protect him. But then Abu Jahl got in the way and he had to uh, withdraw. So there seems to be that deep down inside, it's not any good, rather we call it Jahiliyyah. That he had the sense of Jahiliyyah that this is my tribe. And how can I fight my own tribe? Allah, Allah knows best. This is my theory. The classical books don't mention anything. Why would Abu Lahab not go out and fight? Of those who uh, initially, and, and by the way, there's no question that even though Abu Lahab was one of the worst, there are people much worse than him. Right? Abu Jahl is much worse than him. Umayyah is much worse than him. Right? So there are people that are much worse than uh, Abu Lahab. Even though Abu Lahab is definitely of the lower category of the, uh, of the uh, disbelievers. Of those who also hesitated and refused to go uh, was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Who is Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah? Who can remind me? Guide? No, 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 no. Utbah is not the guide. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. What did he do that made him... You all know, but you just don't know the name. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah was the one who uh, gifted the grapes to the Prophet ﷺ after the incident of Ta'if. This is Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. That he saw the Prophet ﷺ being tortured and he saw him sitting down in the shade and shelter bleeding and he felt some sympathy uh, for him so he gifted him some grapes with the Christian slave if you remember. right? This is Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. And again Utbah has some, uh, some noble qualities throughout. We notice a number of noble qualities throughout the seerah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, and he was a distant uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah himself initially decided not to go and fight because again these are his own relatives. However, his brother Shayba, Utbah and Shayba were blood brothers. His brother Shayba said, if we abandon our people at a time such as this crucial time, then for the rest of our lives we will have to suffer mockery and humiliation. That if we don't stand up to our principles and our cause now, it will forever be a cause of aib, a cause of embarrassment for as long as we live. And so the both of them uh, prepared uh, to go out and they did not know and realize that the both of them were preparing for their own debts. In fact, their debts were the first deaths of, or of the first deaths of the Battle of Badr, as we'll study, they died in the Mubaraza. The Mubaraza is the pre-battle, the battle before the battle. The, it's, a, it's a duel to the death, right? This is the duel to the death that precedes the wars. This is how the Arabs would fight. And Utbah and uh, his brother Shayba, they were of those who died in this uh, pre-battle. And uh, Utbah, by the way, he, he clearly demonstrates some common sense and some values that he believed in. And Utbah is the one, again I'm jumping the gun, but so, so that you understand uh, who is Utbah. Utbah is the one who tried to prevent the battle till the very last second. Till the very last second. I'm going to repeat this story, inshallah, next week. Uh, but uh, Utbah was the one who, when the two armies had lined up, Utbah was just so disgusted that cousins and uncles and brothers and sons are all going to fight each other, that he devised a scheme and a tactic and he, uh, the, the story is long, I'll talk about it next week, but it, what happened was he then jumped on his red camel, he had a red camel, and he was galloping throughout the ranks and he was telling uh, the Quraysh, do not fight, even if you win you will be the losers because you will have killed your own brothers and sons, right? What type of victory is this when you go home having been proud of killing your own cousin and brother? How is this a victory? And uh, he said, blame it on me and my cowardice, go ahead and tell the Arabs. Now that's what you call a noble man, right? That he's saying, go ahead and tell them that I became scared and I was the one who stopped you. I don't mind. Let the blame come to me, even though you all know I'm not a coward, but go and tell them that I became a coward today. Now that is really a sense of 
nobility. This is Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Right? Nonetheless, uh, uh, his brother told him that uh, if you stop now, then for the rest of your, our lives, we're going to have to hear the waswas. We're going to have to hear the, the, the innuendos of the uh, Quraysh that we didn't participate when we should have participated. And therefore, his, what we now call blind nationalism, Really, this is what caused him to basically support his cause. And this is, Islam is always against blindly supporting any cause. Only the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is the human being that we support unconditionally. Right? As for other human beings, we look at their cause. We look at their methodology. We look at who they are. The only person who is unconditionally supported is the Prophet Wasallam. Everything else, every other person, we need to see what is right and what is wrong. This is uh, this type of jahiliya, this type of asabiya, this type of uh, supporting your party. Right or wrong, I don't care, I'm going to support it. Right? This is typical in humanity. You find it in nationalism, you find it even along the, let's say, political lines, Democrat and Republican, sometimes people are so blinded, they really don't care. It's their party, they were born in it, khalas, they're, they're going to support it right and wrong. And we as Muslims are told, no, follow the truth even if it is against yourself, against your mother and father, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Even if it's against your parents, speak the truth. Follow the truth, it is above any uh, person or any blind cause. And this is what we find here, that Utbah was a wise man in the end of the day. In in fact, again I'm jumping the gun, this is all next week's halaqa. The Prophet ﷺ said, if anybody in that gathering has wisdom, it is the man on the red camel. And another version, if anybody has any khair, any good in him, it is the man on the red camel. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the man on the red camel who was Utbah, he is the one who embodies all that is good in the Jahiliya Arabs, in the Quraysh. These are the, if they have any good, it is this man, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. But still, what happened? When he tried to, uh, Abu Jahl won over, and Utbah then in his anger, again I'm jumping the gun, but Abu Jahl accused him of something, and in his anger, he became the first person to go out and fight, in the Mubaraza. Look at blind rage, what happens? Look at the sense of, I don't care what, right or wrong, I will support my cause. Once he threw in the towel, as they say, once he agreed, khalas, he became the first victim to his own fanaticism. Because what was he fanatic about? The cause of jahiliya, the cause of tribalism. Why did he not want to fight the process? Not for any truth or falsehood. He believed the truth was on his side. But it was a sense of jahili tribalism. That's all it was, right? And so that was what was cause motivating him. That's not a noble cause. And therefore it's not going to take him uh, all the way uh, uh, as much as it needed to be. Uh, so Utbah ibn Rabi'ah eventually was also convinced. And therefore he also agreed to go and participate. Yet another uh, person who was uh, hesitating to go but for totally different reasons. So Utbah and Abu Lahab, perhaps their reasons were somewhat noble from Jahili standards. As for one who was uh, not wanting to go out of pure cowardice, this is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was perhaps the lowest of the low of the entire enemies of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I've mentioned many times before that those who opposed Islam in Mecca, we can say that there was a spectrum. That some of them, they say the higher side of the spectrum, even though they're pagans and mushriks and kafirs, they nonetheless had some nobility. That they didn't stoop to uh, cheap shots. They didn't, they didn't do that which was undignified. And the best example of this is Abu Sufyan. That Abu Sufyan, despite his, his jahiliya, his paganism and whatnot, he had a sense of nobility in him. And that is why we don't have any narrations where he did something crude or vulgar or, or demeaning to his own dignity. He didn't do that. He was a noble enemy and therefore eventually Allah guided him. As I said many times, generally speaking, of course there are always exceptions, generally speaking, those who are noble enemies, we find that Allah guides them. Means they had some good in them, right? And those who were the lowly, the vulgar, the crude, the disgusting enemies, those who had no manners and akhlaq, generally speaking, we find that these were not guided. Again, there are exceptions, but this is the general rule. And Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayl, perhaps we can say he was the filthiest of the filthy. The worst of the worst. And perhaps this is a wisdom why Allah did not even mention him in the Quran. That he's indirectly mentioned Abu Jahl, he's directly mentioned Abu Lahab, but Uqba is so filthy he's not even worthy of being mentioned. And where do we begin about Uqba and what um, uh, Uqba has done? Uh, Uqba is, is the one who, uh, in the incident we mentioned in the persecution of the Muslims, Uqba was that one who 
snuck up behind the Prophet ﷺ, took off his, his garment, his shawl, and he tried to ch uh, choke the Prophet ﷺ while he was praying in front of the Kaaba. And Abu Bakr came running up and he said, Rabbi Allah. This is now a verse from the Quran that will you kill a man just because he says Allah is his Lord? You're going to murder him? And he's trying to choke the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Bakr had to go and defend uh, Uqba, uh, uh, defend the Prophet ﷺ against Uqba. And that was when Abu Bakr was beaten and bloodied and bruised until he was in his house for a week or two. We mentioned this story in detail. Uh, Uqba is the one who was amongst those who uh, suggested and approved assassinating the Prophet ﷺ in that secret meeting. Right, this is the, the Darun Najwa, the secret meeting that they had that to assassinate the Prophet. Uqba was in that crowd to suggest it and to approve it. And Uqba was that filthy person who, uh, when Abu Jahl mocked uh, the, the Prophet in Sajda, that they were with a group of people, that Abu Jahl said, Who amongst you will go and pick up the carcass of an animal that had just been slaughtered? An animal had just been slaughtered, and in those days, an animal was not slaughtered every day. This is a rare event. An animal is slaughtered once every few weeks. And then the carcass and the, the entrails and the intestine is thrown in the, in the outside, in the junkyard. And so Abu Jahl said, Who amongst you will throw this when the Prophet is doing Sajda? on him because they would mock the Prophet in Sajda. You know, the Sajda is not something the Quraysh did. The Sajda is an Islamic uh, routine. The Muslims bow down their heads to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this posture was being mocked by Abu Jahl and they're laughing and they're uh, hitting each other on the backs and they're saying, who's gonna now uh, to make fun of the Prophet throw this carcass on him? And so, uh, as Ibn Ishaq said, فَقَامَ فِي الْقَوْمِ أَشْقَاهُمْ The most worst of the people stood up and rushed to get it and that was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it was the one who rushed outside of the uh, the city. And this is a nobleman, he's not he's not a poor person. He's a, he's a slave owner. He's a nobleman, he is a, a rich person, and yet he picks up this filthy, can you imagine like the flies and the filth and the blood and the gore, can you imagine he's going to pick this up, right? He would never do this for any cause, but the filthiness inside of him was worse than the filthiness of this carcass. For him to pick up this filth, and to rush back happy, rejoicing that yes, I'm going to throw this on the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine what type of mentality is that, right? This is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'il. And this is the one who, when he threw it on, they're all laughing and the Prophet ﷺ was stuck. As you know, he was stuck there. It was so heavy on him. And Ibn Mas'ud is saying that I saw him and I could not do anything because Ibn Mas'ud is a, a slave. Ibn Mas'ud is a mawla. They would have cut his head off. But he or somebody runs to Fatima because she's a Qurashi. And Fatima then goes, and she is the one as a young girl crying. Uh, she is the one who helps uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, out from under this. And uh, it is narrated that Uqba once, uh, he sarcastically invited the Prophet ﷺ to a meal. Sarcastically, like, come, have, I'm having a dinner, come, have a feast with me as well. And the Prophet ﷺ said that I will never eat with you until you testify, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. I will never eat, you think I'm going to sit and eat with you? And so in his anger, astaghfirullah, he spit upon the face of the Prophet ﷺ. This is Uqba ibn Mu'it. He spit upon the face of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ calmly wiped that spit away, and he predicted the prediction that would happen. And he said, O oh, Uqba, when I meet you outside of the valleys of Mecca, I shall execute you, or I shall kill you, or I shall chop your head off, is the Arabic word, which means I shall kill you. And it was literally chopping over the head off while you are tied up. This was a prediction. The pro Uqba was the nobleman, and the Prophet is now being persecuted. Uqba said, uh, the Prophet said, just wait. When I will meet you the next time outside of Mecca, right now you are in Mecca. The next time we meet outside of Mecca, or we can say, the first time I meet you outside of Mecca, the situation will be turned around now. That your execution will be at my hand. And your execution will be uh, as a prisoner of war, basically. And so, Uqba was frightened when he heard of the Battle of Badr. He said, this man has promised to kill me. This man has promised to kill me and I cannot go out of Mecca now. Now look at the irony here, that deep down inside he knows this prediction is true, right? Deep down inside he actually knows this is going to happen. And so he does not want to leave uh, Mecca. But one of his entourage, one of his family, we don't know who the name is not mentioned, he said, don't worry, I have the fastest camel, I will give it to you. Even if the army flees, don't worry, your camel will take you far away from 
the camp, you will come back to Mecca safe, right? And so with this promise, uh, and uh, the others were also uh, castigating him and making fun of him, he decided he had to uh, prove his manhood, and so he decided to go ahead and accompany, and uh, this person gave him the fastest camel, but you cannot outwit the Makkar or the Kaid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, when the army fled in the Badr, we're going to come to this, when the army fled, Uqba's camel was the first to flee. And so Uqba was left in the middle of an empty plain with no person and no camel and nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the Muslims captured him as a prisoner of war. And as we'll come to probably in two, three weeks, Allah knows when we'll get to that. But uh, Uqba was one of only two people who were executed. The Battle of Badr, there were no executions. All of the prisoners were released except for two. And number one on the list is Uqba. Right? For all of these reasons. So Uqba was scared and he knew something was going to happen. And indeed it did happen because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, predicted that it would happen. And of those who try desperately also to get out of the battle of Badr is Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf is the slave master of Bilal. Right? He was the one who did what he did to Bilal. And his death is a gruesome death as well. Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the uh, typical uh, coward. He is the typical overly fed huge man wearing fancy garments. The typical, the stereotypical, you know, uh, <laughs> richer, you know, nobleman of Mecca. He doesn't have any skills at war. He's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of slaves. He wears the fanciest garment. And Ibn Ishaq says he was a big man. And he was, mashallah, tabarakallah, right? That, that type of man. And so, uh, when Umayyah ibn Khalaf heard about the battle of Badr, he found somebody to go with him. And he said, I'll pay you as much as you want. You are my representative. You will fight and you will basically, yani, not pretend to be me, but you will say, this is the representative Umayyah ibn Khalaf, right? And so, uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf was very happy. He managed to get out of it. But Umayyah is, no doubt, one of the seniors of the Quraysh. He is one of the top five leaders of the Quraysh. And his presence will bring great morale to the troops. So Abu Jahl heard of this. Abu Jahl is, there is no doubt, number one on the list of enemies. The worst person is Abu Jahl, right? As the Prophet said, he is the Fir'aun of my Ummah. Abu Jahl, he gets involved in every matter he can. Abu Jahl turns the tide many times for the worst. And this is one of them. That uh, when he heard of Umayyah not going, he went to Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And he said, if you do not go, this will demoralize uh, many people. You are the Sayyid of this whole valley. He's boosting him up, his ego, right? He's not the Sayyid, but he's one of the Sayyid. He's one of the leader. You are the Sayyid of this whole valley, and your presence is necessary. Still, he was hesitant. Abu Jahl, despite his force, could, he still could not convince him. So what did he do? Abu Jahl then went to the same Uqba. The same Uqba, right? And they devised a, a tactic to humiliate him in public, to make sure that he goes out. What did they do? So when Umayyah is sitting uh, in the Nadi, the Nadi is the public space, right? The Nadi is the, uh, the, the, the Senate, if you like, outside of the Kaaba, there's this open area. This is called the Nadi. So in the daytime, all of the Quraysh would sit there. Uh, so when Umayyah was sitting on his fancy carpet and he has his entourage and he has his clothes on him, so Uqba came to him with a, a perfume burner and the uh, coal underneath it of the type that women use. So they had feminine perfume, right? Of the type that women use. And he brought him and said, this is your gift, O Umayyah. Perfume yourself as you are worthy of being perfumed. You get the hint here. That you are no man. You are a woman. You're, you're deciding to not fight when you need to be. And of course, Umayyah understands exactly what's going on. This is how the Arabs did their smearing to each other. Right? This is how the Quraysh did it. He, he understands what is going on. And so he stood up and he cursed Uqba. Literally, he cursed Uqba and whoever sent Uqba. Because he knew Uqba is not smart enough to do this himself, right? So, and by the way, Uqba himself, you can tell, he is overcompensating for his own uh, cowardice before. Right? Uqba himself is just barely convinced. Now he needs to show he is dedicated to the cause. So Uqba is the one that is sent by Abu Jahl to push Umayyah to go uh, fight. And so even then, by the way, Umayyah's cowardice shows. When he goes back home, Ibn Ishaq tells us, he tells his wife that go purchase for me the best camel that money can buy. Why? 
run back if I need to, right? His wife begs him, don't go, you never know, you might die, this and that. And he tells her, don't worry, I don't really intend to fight, I'm just going to make a show of it and then just quietly sneak back, don't worry. You know, even so to the last, that Umayyah did not intend to fight. He was not a fighter in any sense of the term. And he just wanted to spend a few days and hopefully uh, he would just sneak away or he would make an excuse and come back. He never intended to fight. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا لِيَهْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ عَنْ بَيِّنَا That Allah will cause to pass what He has willed will pass. And so everybody who will die will be, uh, will be caused to die. And Umayyah's name was amongst those. And by the way, the incident of the, uh, the, the camel or the... Uh, uh, the, the goat being thrown onto the Prophet right? You all know that after this happened, we mentioned this many months ago when we talked about this, when the Prophet stood up with the blood on him, he said, Oh Allah, I leave you to deal with, and he mentioned all of these seven or eight people by name, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, and Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, and Abu Jahl, and everyone whom he mentioned, every one of them, this list, were the first people who died at Badr. Right, and so, he is one of them over here as well. And he knows that this is very risky for him. Nonetheless, uh, so uh, uh, Umayyah as well, Ibn Khalaf, Umayyah ibn Khalaf then, uh, even though he purchases as uh, we are led to, um, of course the detail is not mentioned, but he tells his wife, go and purchase, and notice he even tells his wife, like he, he's too embarrassed to go himself, like he, to, to people wouldn't know, go and purchase the fanciest camel you can. Uh, and so he prepares himself and he doesn't realize he himself is also preparing his own uh, death. Um, uh, in the tafsir of a suddi it is mentioned that before they left Mecca, all of the Quraysh gathered around the Kaaba and they made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they held on to the rings of the Kaaba and the cloth of the Kaaba. And they said, Oh Allah, whichever of these two armies is more noble in your eyes, help them. And O oh Allah, whichever of these two groups is more honorable, then give them victory. And O oh Allah, send your aid upon the better of the two tribes. And little did they realize they are making dua against themselves. They're making dua against themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references this in the Quran. Surah Al-Anfal. And by the way, Surah Al-Anfal, uh, all of it deals with the uh, incident of Badr. And inshallah, I am seriously thinking about when we finish the Battle of Badr, we actually pause for one halaqa and just do Surah Al-Anfal as Battle of Badr. Because honestly, I think one of the biggest uh, drawbacks of most Sirah books is that they actually don't discuss the entire Quranic relevance verses, you know. And I think it's very important personally that we actually discuss the Quranic verses and Surah Al-Anfal, all of it, and it's only 10 pages. Uh, it's not a very long surah, it's a middle-sized surah. The whole surah is about the Battle of Badr beginning to end. I'm seriously figuring out if we can manage to do that in, in one halaqa, inshaAllah uh, ta'ala. So, um, we said that uh, uh, they, they gathered outside of the Kaaba and they made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah references this in Surah Al-Anfal verse 19. Surah Al-Anfal verse 19. In tastaftihu faqad ja'akum al-fatih. If you are asking for victory, then the victory has already come. Meaning on the other side, not on your side. In tastaftihu faqad ja'akum al-fatih. Wa in tantahu fahuwa khayrul lakum. Now, the verse is a reference to the Quraysh, not to the Muslims. The reference to the Muslims has already come. We're going to mention this when we get to Surah Al-Anfal. That Allah says, when you asked Allah for help, Allah said, I'm sending down all of these angels. This is in the beginning of the Surah, right? Now Allah mentions the other side. In tastaftihu. If you are asking Allah for fatah, fatah means victory, right? Then don't worry. فقد جاءكم, فقد جاء, in tastaftihu, فقد جاء الفتح, that the victory has already come, not to you. It has already been sent down. The victory has come, but not to you. But if you stop what you're doing, it is better for you. And if you return to war, we shall return to war. And all of your numbers will not help you, even if you are a lot. Because Allah is with the muttaqeen and not with you. So Allah references that you are asking for victory, don't worry, the victory has already come, too late. You are asking for it is not going to change where the victory will be coming uh, down. Now the, uh, the Quraysh uh, left Mecca, they began marching outside of Mecca and the whole army came and at that time, 
we'll mention why it came down. At that time, their numbers were around 1,300. Around 1,300 people uh, gathered together. And this was the largest army that the Quraysh had ever gathered in its history. And Islam brought many changes with it. Of it, it is literally uh, exponential, the sizes of the army is increasing. The Quraysh, as we have said many times, is a tribal society. You don't get 5, 10, 15 tribes joining together to fight another 5, 10, 15. No, small tribes fighting other tribes. An average skirmish would be 200 people, 100 people versus another 100, 200 people. This is how you would do it. For the first time, numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in Badr, it's 1,300. In Uhud, it is 3,000. In Ahzab, it is 5,000. It's getting bigger and bigger. And every army is breaking records before it. Because clearly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intending in a very expedited way. It's an exponential. Literally, Allah Azza wa is attending the entire conquest of Mecca, of the, uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. So, they had 1,300 people as they're exiting. And from the beginning, we noticed that the Quraysh are not united. There's always bickering. Allah says in the Quran, تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى You think they're one group, but in reality, their hearts are disunited. You think they're one, but in reality, their hearts are disunited. And this disunity began from the very exiting of Mecca. That one group uh, began debating amongst themselves that, hold on a sec, we're leaving Mecca unprotected. All of the men of fighting age are marching outside of Mecca. And then they brought up an old rivalry that existed before the coming of Islam. This is paranoia. It's been now 10 years since this rivalry. It's still fresh, meaning the people who are involved are still alive. But nothing has happened because when Islam came, both tribes had to deal with this new message of Islam. Right? What had happened, the, the Quraysh or the, 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 the Quraysh and the Banu Bakr, another tribe, the Quraysh and the Banu Bakr had started a small uh, tension or war. To make a long story short, uh, one of the Quraysh youth, uh, wandered into the land of the Banu Bakr and he was a future leader of, of the Quraysh and uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that he was a tall and handsome man and so when the leader of the Banu Bakr saw him he felt jealousy that this boy is going to become the leader this boy was a very handsome and, and strong man he felt a sense of jealousy and so he told one of the Banu Bakr to go and uh, assassinate him just kill him for, just for no reason in the middle of the desert and before this, by many years or decades, uh, they had a blood feud that the uh, one member of the Quraysh had killed somebody from the Banu Bakr. So, they say, so he said, I'm going to make up for that one for one. I'm going to make it up by killing this young man. So when the Quraysh sent a representative that, what is this? Why did you do this? So the, the, the chieftain of Banu Bakr said, a man for a man. A man for a man. That... Remember that guy you killed? And he mentioned some name, we don't know when, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Remember that guy? I killed this boy for that boy, for that young man that was killed. So let's just call it quits. A man for a man. So the Quraysh said, okay, fine. You know what? A man for a man. He's right, actually, that they did, we did owe them blood money. We never paid up. So instead of paying 100 camels, we'll just not go to war. And so uh, the brother of this killed man, the brother of this Quraysh who was killed, he decided to go and assassinate the chieftain of the Banu Bakr, not just any average guy, the very man who was jealous, the very man who ordered the assassination. And so he succeeded in this mission. And the chieftain of the Banu Bakr was assassinated, and this brother, this is in the days of Jahili, this is before Islam came, this is before the coming of the Prophet This brother brought back the clothes and the sword of the chieftain of the Banu Bakr, bloodied, and he had a gruesome death as well. He uh, cut him into pieces, he cut his stomach up, and then he brought this back and he put it on the door of the Kaaba. That look, look at what I have done. He put it on the door of the Kaaba. And so the news spread that uh, the Quraysh has basically killed the chieftain of Banu Bakr. Now this is war. This is civil war between the Banu Bakr and the Quraysh. And before any war could take place, the message of Islam became stronger and stronger and the both tribes basically just paused for a while. So the situation was now in limbo. It's unresolved. And so for some reason, they get paranoid that now the Banu Bakr are going to come and they're going to attack Mecca. When it's empty, they'll take our women, they'll kill our children, they'll take our possessions, they'll get their vengeance now. Okay, So there was a huge commotion in the army, rumors spread, and as it is, generally people don't want to go to war, they want an excuse to get back. Right. So this is an excuse now. The army was about to return, or at least a large segment of it. Then what happened? 
Shaytan became desperate. Shaytan, Iblis himself became desperate. That what am I going to do now? And so Iblis appeared to them. Physically Iblis came. And Allah mentions this in the Quran as we'll mention. Iblis came to them in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik, the same Suraqa ibn Malik who was attempting to catch the Prophet in the Hijrah. It's the same Suraqa. Why Suraqa? Because Suraqa was uh, from the uh, Banu Kinana, and the Banu Kinana is the larger tribe of the Banu Bakr, i.e., the Quraysh and the Banu Hashim, the same relationship. Right, the Banu Hashim is one of the tribes of the Quraysh, right? So the Banu Kinana r rivals the Quraysh. And the Banu Bakr is one of the tribes of the Banu Kinana. Clear? Tribalism has to be studied when you study the seerah. Clear? Right? And uh, uh, Suraqa was from another of the tribes of the Banu Kinana, but nonetheless, yani he's from the Banu Kinana. He's from the equivalent of the Quraysh. So, and he's a chieftain of their tribe. So Suraqa comes and says, don't worry. I have heard of your fear. I will make sure that the Banu Bakr do not attack you. Clear? Right? Shaitan basically comes in the form of a nobleman whom they all knew and trusted and respected, Suraqa. And of course at the time Suraqa was not a Muslim. Suraqa became a Muslim later on, as you know. We mentioned the story of Suraqa in detail. Uh, that the, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, Shaitan came to them in the form of Suraqa and said to them that don't worry, I promise you that as long as you are gone, I shall protect Mecca that I am وَإِنِّي جَارُ لَكُمْ That I will be your protector. I will be your, uh, you can count on my word that the Banu Bakr are not going to attack uh, Mecca. And Suraqa even said, you know what, I'll accompany you as well so that you know that I am serious. Even though he's not from the Quraysh, even though it's not his fight, even though the, the Banu Kinana are not involved in the caravan. It's nothing. But Suraqa, allegedly, Suraqa said, to show you how clearly we will not attack, I will fight along with you. And so they were so happy that one of the chieftains of the Banu Kinana is coming. This is a big morale boost. And then when Suraqa, quote unquote Suraqa, it's not Suraqa, this is Shaitan. When Shaitan, we should say, uh, uh, sees the angels coming down on the morning of Badr, and we'll come back to the story when we get to the morning of Badr. When Shaitan sees the angels coming down, nakasa ala aqibayhi. Allah mentions all of this in the Quran, right? He turned around and he started running away. And the Quraysh were like, Suraqa, why are you running away? Because they cannot see the angels. They cannot see the angels, right? So the Quraysh were like, well, why are you running away? Didn't you say you're going to fight with us? And one of them tried to stop him because he's come all the way. Can you imagine? From Mecca, he's come all the way to Badr. The morning of the battle of Badr. This is when Suraqa sees all of those angels come. That's when he turns around and he runs away. And when one of them tries to stop him, Shaitan basically shows his true identity, pushes him so hard, the man just flies up in the air. Uh, and... Uh, quote unquote Suraqa, a Shaytan says that Inni ara ma la tarun. This is in the Quran. Inni ara ma la tarun. This is uh, Surah uh, Surat Al Anfal, verse 47 48. Surah Al Anfal, 47 48. That um, uh, Allah says in the Quran uh, that Wa id zayyana lahum al Shaytanu a'ma lahum. This is the verse. Wa id zayyana lahum al Shaytanu a'ma lahum. When Shaytan made their actions beautiful for them. This is the story of Suraqa now. When Shaitan beautified their actions, go ahead, fight, you're doing a good cause. Uh, وَقَالَ لَا لَا وَقَالَ لَا لَا no, لَا 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 And he said, none amongst mankind can defeat you. لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ None amongst mankind can defeat you. Why? Because you are so many. You have so much, so many weapons. You have thirteen hundred people. Wa inni jarul lakum, and I am your guarantor, your protector. Wa inni jarul lakum. It doesn't mean I'm your neighbor. It means I'm your protector here. I'll make sure nothing happens back there. Falamma taraat al fi'atan. When the two armies faced one another, nakasa ala aqibah. He turned his back around, right? And he said, Wa qala inni ara mala taron. I can see what you guys cannot see. Inni Allah Rabbal Alameen. I am scared of Allah. Shaitan is scared. I am scared of Allah, the uh, Lord of the world. Wallahu shadid uqab. Allah is severe in punishment. So this is uh, the first, if you like, notice of the differences in the army of the uh, Quraysh. 
Uh, it, we, we know from a number of riwayat, Imam Ahmed's Mustad and Ibn Ishaq and others, we know that when the army left, there were 1,300 people. Abu Jahl is the undisputedly, the main leader is Abu Jahl. They had over 100 horses, over 600 uh, suits of armor. We don't even know the number of camels, uh, uh, probably around four or 500 camels. We don't know the exact, not only to ride on, but also to use as food. Uh, it is said, we're going to come to this, that every day they had to slaughter 10 camels. And so they must have uh, hundreds of camels because they're slaughtering 10 camels every day and they, they have to ride on the camels as well. And they even brought along their uh, singing girls, their qayyinat. And the, the singing girls, you understand there's a connotation here as well. And there's also uh, the issue of uh, having uh, some morale as well. That the girls are going to be beating their drums, they're going to be dancing, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be showing, displaying uh, the pride of the Quraysh. And so they brought their uh, cheap sloganeering, you can say, as well. This is cheap sloganeering. They brought their uh, cheerleaders, you can say, right? They really, they are a type of cheerleaders, you can, you can say. That uh, they brought them along as well. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. Uh, Surah Al-Anfal, verse 19. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرِيَاءَ النَّاسِ وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Don't be like those who exited their houses. بَطَرًا وَرِيَاءً That they are arrogant, they're boastful. And they want to show off to the people. And they want to block the path of Allah. وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ مُحِيطٍ And Allah is surrounding all that they do. So Allah describes their psychological frame of mind. When they're walking out, they're feeling puffed up. بَطَرًا And رِيَاءً They want people to hear they're 1300 strong. We're the largest army uh, the Arabs have ever seen. And so this is another point here. That up until this time, 1300 people have never gathered in this backward area. Because again, there's no government every tribe to himself. For the first time they have 1300. So they want the Arabs to hear. The Quraysh have gathered the largest army ever. So Allah mentions what is their niyyah. And Allah says, what was their main niyyah? They're blocking the path of Allah. And wallahu bima ya'abluna muhit. Rather Allah has surrounded all of them. They think they're blocking Allah's path. They do not realize Allah has blocked them. Wallahu bima ya'abluna muhit. And uh, Another incident occurred uh, soon after this that, well, let's get back. So, so the army of Quraysh has left Mecca. Abu Sufyan, once he realizes that he's in the safety, we go back to now the caravan, right? So, so there's three things going on. The Prophet ﷺ, the Quraysh army, and Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, once he realizes that he's beyond the reach of the Muslim army, once he's realized that he's in the, he's in the green, he sends another emissary, another envoy, and he mentions uh, to him that go tell the Quraysh, that they can now return, that the caravan is safe. Notice, even Abu Sufyan did not want war. He did not want the Battle of Badr. He didn't see. What he wanted was protection for the caravan. There's no need now for protection. The caravan is now in the green. It's in the safety zone. And so Abu Sufyan sent an emissary, go tell the army to return. We don't need their help now. I'll be back in Mecca in a few days. So once the envoy reached the Meccan army, they had to now, they're already outside the city, they've been camping for two, three days outside the city, uh, traveling for two, three days, not camping, and now they have to reconvene. What are we supposed to do now? Some of them, primary amongst them was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah, the same Utbah who didn't want to go, the same Utbah who to the very end does not want war. Utbah says, okay, now we clearly don't need to fight, let's go back to Mecca. The job has been done, the caravan is safe. Once again, Abu Jahl was adamant. And Abu Jahl said, no, we will go to Badr. We will go to Badr. Badr was known for being a nice plain area uh, and there was lots of water because there was these wells there. So we will go to Badr. It also had some grave, uh, not grave, some, some date palm uh, le uh, plantations there. So it was a, a type of oasis. We will go to Badr and we will stay there for three days. And we will drink our wine and have our women sing for us and let the Arabs hear that we are a strong and mighty nation. So again, he has the Jahili mentality. Now notice here, there's still not a talk of war. Perhaps Abu Jahl had it in his heart, but there's still not a talk of war. The whole purpose of the army was to protect the caravan. 
There's still not a talk of fighting for, for no reason now. Khalas, the caravan is protected. Why do you need to fight? Utbah saying, let's go back. Abu Jahl insists. And even now he says, let the Arabs hear of our, 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 our uh, strength and let us uh, slaughter our camels eat or cook our meat, drink our wine and let the news spread in all of Arabia that we are a nation to be feared. We are a Quraysh that people should be scared of us. Despite this, some tribes decided to come back because they had no interest in fighting the Muslims. They only wanted their money to be protected, their investments to be protected. The largest of these was the Banu Zuhra and perhaps other smaller tribes also joined. So much so that around 300 or 350 people returned back to Mecca. And so the army went down from 1300 to around 1000 or in another report 950 men. So around one third of the army now goes back and this is also obviously a big uh, demoralizing uh, factor. And Allah Azza wa Jal again mentions this in the Quran that the ikhtilaf or the differences, there's tensions going on amongst the Muslims as well because the Muslims did not want to meet the, the Quraysh army as we'll come to and there's tensions in the Quraysh army for a whole different reason that they just don't want to uh, engage and Allah says in the Quran again Surah Al-Anfal وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِعَادِ If the two of you had agreed to a fight you still would not have been able to set a time and a place. Right? Even if you two wanted it, you wouldn't have done it. But I wanted it. وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِعَادِ وَلَكِنْ لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا But rather Allah wanted His commandment that had already been decreed, Allah wanted to fulfill it. It's a beautiful verse here that Allah is saying, even if the both of you intended for a war, it wouldn't have taken place. You would have disagreed, you would have not been uh, uh, fully on the same page, but neither of you wanted it, Allah wanted it. Why? In order that His Qadr be done. وَلَكَ لِيَقْضِ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا And لِيَهْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ عَنْ بَيْنَةٍ وَيْحَ مَنْ حَيَّ عَنْ بَيْنَةٍ So that whoever dies, dies after the proof has been established, and whoever lives, lives after the proof has been uh, established. And so uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying that, no one can ever escape from the Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Another incident that is mentioned is that when the army reached uh, Juhfa, and Juhfa is where Masjid Aisha Tan'im is, that's the area of Juhfa. When the army reached uh, this area, so most likely this took place before Abu Sufyan's envoy reached them. But again, we're just trying to piece it together. Uh, most likely this took place basically as soon as they left Mecca. One of the youngest men in the army from the tribe of Banu Hashim, i.e. a cousin of the Prophet uh, or to be technical, uh, his cousin's son. So uh, uh, he's one generation below the Prophet he's a young man, the youngest of the Banu Hashim. He woke up startled because he had seen a dream. And he said, in, and he announced to the Quraysh what the, the, the dream that he had seen. He said, in my dream, I saw a man riding towards us, an announcer a crier to give us a, a news and message and he had a camel with him and the man announced Uzba ibn Rabi'ah has been killed and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah has been killed and Abu al-Hakam ibn Hisham ay Abu Jahl has been killed and Umayya ibn Khalaf has been killed and he kept on mentioning so and so and so and so every single famous name of Quraysh that eventually was killed he mentioned all of these names and then he cut the hump of the camel and sent the camel forward. And the camel went into our uh, tent area, our uh, encampment. So he's seeing his own encampment in the dream. And the blood splattered on every single tent of our encampment. And he woke up scared and flustered. Obviously the interpretation is very obvious that not only are these people going to be killed, but every tent will have casualties. Every single house of the Quraysh will have casualties, but they ignored his dream and they just uh, considered it to be uh, uh, just a, a dream that he had seen, not realizing that it was a true dream. So let us pause on the, the Quraysh side. Let's now go to the Muslim side. Now what's happening on the Muslim side? We'll get back to the Quraysh side in a while, maybe most likely next uh, Wednesday, inshallah. Now the, 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 the Muslims, when they left Medina, they had no clue that they're going to meet an army. It's not even an inclination. Right, so the totally different perspective now. The Muslims are leaving Medina and they literally think this is going to be an easy raid. 
a raid where we are, mashallah, 315 and there's only 40 of their armed guards. Like we have a ratio of almost 1 to 10 basically, right? We're almost 1 to 10 of their guard and we'll have a clear victory. However, rumors began to come. And this is the way of the, uh, the, the, the Bedouins, that Bedouins are traveling back and forth and they'll carry the news that something's happening. And every time you meet a traveler in the desert, you would ask, where are you from? What are you doing? What is the news? And the rumors began to spread that rather there is an army that has left Mecca intending to fight with the uh, Muslims. And the Prophet wasallam. Now he was shown a dream, we don't know when, and I get, I get back to this next week inshallah. Uh, we, we don't know when, but he was shown a dream that he will be fighting an army. And he was hoping that this dream would be later on, maybe not in this particular expedition, maybe not in this expedition. Then when the rumors began to reach, so the Prophet himself began to then question the Muslims. What do you think? Because what had he told them? We, we said that initially he kept it a secret, right? He said, we're going on an expedition. Then as soon as they exited the city, when he knows who's in the, 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 the Muslim camp, then he said that we are going out to meet the caravan of Abu Sufyan and perhaps Allah will give us a huge ghanima, a huge uh, booty with this. Right? So the people became very happy. Then, after a day or two, when these rumors are now coming, now the tone begins to change because news is reaching to the contrary. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you think that instead if we met a group from Mecca that has been already informed of your departure, i.e. a group that is prepared to fight you. And some of the Sahaba began to question this. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we do not have any preparations to fight an army. We came to attack Al-Air, the caravan. We came to attack the caravan. We're not ready to engage in a fight. The next day he repeated the question again and the response was even more firm. We cannot do this. We're not ready to engage in an army. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. That, وَإِذْ أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ That when your Lord calls you to go out of your houses, so notice Allah is causing the both armies to leave. Right? We already mentioned that one group has left Mecca. Now Allah is talking about the Muslims. That Allah is saying, وَإِذْ أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ That remember when your Lord caused you to exit your own houses, but the truth was with you. وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ A group of the believers did not like it. وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ بَعْدَ مَا تَبَيَّنْ They began arguing with you about this truth. Even after it was made clear to them. It was as if you were dragging them to their debts as they're looking at their debts. I.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mildly rebuking some of the companions. That they were so scared they thought they're going to die and none of them died. They thought you're dragging them to their death, you're dragging them to the greatest victory. Right? So they began arguing with you. They began arguing, we can't do this, no way. There's no way we can fight the Quraysh. And Allah says, it's as if they're, they're seeing themselves die. They don't trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they'll take care of them, that Allah will take care of them. Right? And Allah, uh, and uh, when Allah says, تبين, even after it was made clear, what is this after it was made clear? The next verse explains, وَإِذْ يَعِدُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ أَنَّهَا لَكُمْ Allah had promised that yes, you're going to meet one of these two, Ihda Ta'ifatain. Whichever one you meet, you will be the victors. Ihda Ta'ifatain annaha lakum. So the Prophet told them, at this stage he himself is unsure. But he told them, even if we meet the other group, Allah has promised me victory. This is what he told them. Even if we meet the other group, Allah has promised us victory. And so He is telling them, look, don't worry, Allah has promised us victory. But still, the human soul is weak. And they say, we're not ready, we cannot fight an army. We don't have armor, we don't have food, we don't have supplies, we don't have anything. We literally were expecting expedition and come back you know, within two days. Badr is two, three days away from Medina. We're going to come and come back, we don't even have anything. And Allah says, they continued arguing even after you had explained to them. But Allah wanted uh, His decree to go forth. And uh, 
Allah says, لكم. You wanted the one with no weapons, الشوكة, to be yours. You wanted the ghanima, you wanted the booty. But, وَيُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُحِقَّ الْحَقَّ بِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَيَقْطَ عَدَابِرَ الْكَافِرِينَ Allah had a far bigger thing in mind than some money. Allah wanted to show who was upon the truth. يُحِقَّ الْحَقَّ Allah wanted to show who was upon the truth. يَوْمَ الْبَدْرِ is called يَوْمَ الْفُرْقَانِ Remember this, right? The day where truth is clear from falsehood. The, the victory of Badr was unparalleled until the conquest of Mecca. That Badr and the conquest of Mecca are the two biggest victories without a doubt. That this is the first and this is the last victory that Allah Azza wa gave them. And the both of them are miracles beyond miracles. And Allah is saying, today I wanted to show who was true and who was false. That Allah said, لِيُحِقَّ الْحَقَّ وَيُبْطِلَ الْبَاطِلِ To destroy the batil. Even if the kafirun uh, do not like it. So uh, this shows us, by the way, subhanAllah, so many benefits here from this ayah. It shows us that the Sahaba, yes, they are perfect human beings, but they're humans and humans cannot be perfect. They are as perfect a generation as possible. That Allah is saying, يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ They were arguing, we can't do this, no way, we can't fight the Quraysh. Yet this arguing does not make them any less of a believer. Because Allah says in the Quran that فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah calls them mu'min. These are not munafiqs. The Badr, there are no munafiqs in Badr. Nifaq started after Badr as we'll mention. Right? Before Badr, anybody who converted, there is no nifaq up until Badr. Every convert is a sincere convert. So only after Badr, the phenomenon of nifaq begins. So Allah Azza wa Jal called the group that is yujadilun, that is attempting to persuade the Prophet them not to go, Allah calls them mu'min. And what does this show? It's a big sigh of relief for us that look, even the believer, yani he has some hesitation, he has some fear, he has some, it's not as if they're all superhuman or superman, no. There is some genuine fear that look, they didn't want to fight. And Allah Azza wa Jal mildly reproaches them, but He says they are fariqan min al-mu'minin. They are a group of mu'mins. These are not munafiqun that didn't want to go and fight. So, to find, to find uh, uh, a deed difficult, to be a bit hesitant to do a, po a positive deed, this in and of itself is not nifaq. As long as your iman eventually wins over. Allah says in the Quran that كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ وَهُوَ كُرْهُ لَكُمْ Qital has been written for you, but you hate it. Allah says you hate it. Their hatred of qital, did that make them munafiq? No, it did not. It is human nature to not want these types of things. So there is a difference between finding, so waking up for fajr, right? This is our jihad of our times. We thank Allah, this is the type of jihad we need to do, subhanAllah, you know? Waking up for fajr. Every one of us, we might feel on occasion, when the alarm bell goes off, you know, the alarm call goes off. It's like, subhanAllah, another day, can't we just sleep? Do I have to do this? That in and of itself is not nifaq. As long as, what? We get out of bed. If we don't get out of bed, that's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. But to feel the hesitation, right? Or to feel, the, like let's say, let's say those who are going for Hajj for the first time, they're really scared, they're really worried because of all of the problems. Yes, that's Iman, not a problem. It's okay to have a little bit of fear and trepidation and nervousness as long as you overcome it. So Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, the Sahaba uh, felt this type of fear. The Muslims, they also made their way uh, to Badr and they're still not sure the Badr is, of course, on the, on the route to the caravan. Uh, they had expected to, to meet the caravan the first time in the same place of Badr. And they're still proceeding there. And that is why the Quraysh as well, they know this is the most logical place for them to go to. So the both of them are intending uh, to go to Badr. As Allah says, even if you had agreed, you wouldn't do this. But Allah had already planned. Even if you had agreed to set a time and a place, you would not have been managed to meet each other. But Allah had set a plan that you will meet each other. You will, that Allah Azza wa Jalla already decreed this to occur. So the Muslims got to Badr and they're still not sure which of the two uh, groups they're going to meet. And the Prophet took Abu Bakr himself 
as an emissary. Why? Because this is a very tense situation. He didn't even send any other emissary. He and Abu Bakr, they went out scouting for information. And as far as, as I know from my own readings of the seerah, this is the only time that the Prophet himself acted as a scout, as an emissary. That he leaves the army, he himself is the fact collector. And this shows us the sensitivity. This shows us that even the Prophet was worried, what if it is the army, what are we going to do now? And he doesn't want to tell the Muslims until he himself is sure. So he takes the only person that he trusts like beyond anything, his most trustworthy, and that is Abu Bakr. And the two of them go collecting information. They become scouts. They become the, uh, the people, you know, fact-finding. And he takes Abu Bakr and, he, and he's finding uh, information until finally they come across the old, an old Bedouin. And this is the source of information, right? The Bedouins are just wandering in the desert and these are yani, people who are not going to be involved in the fight. They're neutral, they're not, they're Bedouins. They're not in the Quraysh, they're not in the Yathrib, they're not in Medina. They're simply uh, carriers of information. So, uh, the Bedouin obviously does not recognize who these two people are. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ asks him, Do you have any information about the Quraysh and about Muhammad and his army? Not even realizing the Bedouin is that he is Muhammad. He's asking this so that suspicion doesn't fall on him. If he said, do you have any information about the Quraysh? Obviously, which side is he on? He's on the side of the Muslims. In fact, he is Rasulullah right? But in order to like make the Bedouin feel that he himself is also neutral, that he's coming from a neutral tribe. So he asked the Bedouin, do you have any information? What's going on with the Quraysh? I heard some stuff. And what's going on with uh, Muhammad Sassim and his army? What's, what is going on? So the Bedouin said, who are you? I can't tell you until I know which side you're on. Right? He, he's also a wise man. Which side are you on? I will not inform you anything until you tell me who are you. And so, of course, the Prophet cannot say because... He's going to then give away the game plan, right? And so, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, I promise to tell you who, well, that where we are from. Notice very specific now. The Prophet ﷺ knows what he is saying, right? I promise to tell you where we are from. As long as you tell us any information that you have. You have to tell us what you know, and then we will tell you where we are from. So with this confirmation, this Bedouin felt, okay, you know, if they're going to tell me, clearly they're not on one of the two sides, or else they wouldn't want to tell me, right? And so the Bedouin feels like, okay, I can confide in them and they can confide in me. So he said, okay, if you want to know, this is my information. What has reached us is that Muhammad وسلم, has left Yathrib on such and such a date, and he was right. And if this is true, then they are camped right outside of Badr, and he was also right. But of course, the Prophet and the Bedouin right now are not at Badr. They're at another location, right? So the man is thinking, if that information is true, they must almost be at Badr, and he was dead on. Because he's a Bedouin, he knows exactly how, how much armies are taken. So this much the Prophet knew because he is the Prophet And it has reached me that the army of the Quraysh has left Mecca on such and such a date, which was also true. And if that is accurate, then they must be at such and such a location, which was also true, and that was on the other side of Badr. They're going to be there the next day as well. Right? So this is very, well, bad news at the time, but of course Allah Azza wa had a good news plan. That the Bedouin is confirming that there's an army. That he's telling them, and they can verify it because he knows about them. So clearly he knows about the other side as well. That the Bedouins have the, uh, this is their CNN, right? This is their uh, news network here. The Bedouins have their information. And by the way, the Bedouins needed this to live themselves, right? They needed this to survive themselves. They needed to have all of the information to avoid any conflicts or maybe to bribe one side against the other. So this is their information. This is their livelihood. This is their safety. So the Bedouin says, okay, I've told you my information. Now you need to tell me, where are you from? You promised. And obviously the Prophet promised. And so the Prophet said, نَحْنُ مِنْ مَا We are from water. نَحْنُ مِنْ مَا We are from water. And he turned around and rode on of the camel with Abu Bakr at his side. And the old Bedouin was left scratching his head. مِنْ مَا From مَا which ma is this? Is this the ma of Iraq? Like the city of Iraq is ma? Is this the ma of Iraq or which ma? I don't know which ma you're talking about. But the Prophet gave the answer. نَحْنُ min ma. We are from 
water. And this isn't the first time that I've demonstrated this phenomenon called, you should all know it by now, Tawriya. Tawriya. This isn't the first time. Tawriya. Tawriya, again I'll say it. Tawriya, we saw it in Tafsir Surah Yusuf many times. We saw it in the Seerah many times. In the Hijrah, where uh, Abu Bakr said, this is my guide, he's guiding me to the path. Right? This is my had, Yahdini al this is my guide. Right? Tawriya means double meaning. You're hiding the truth with another truth. You're not with a lie. Islam does not allow lying, but at times, Tawriya is permitted. Right? And our Sharia tells us that whoever uses Tawriya excessively, it's only going to be a matter of time before he gets accused of lying, and there's an element of truth in that. But Tawriya in and of itself has a legitimacy because you're not lying. You're not lying. Where are you from? We are from water. Are you not from water? Yes, we are from water. Right? Allah says in the Quran that وَخَلَقْنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ Everything living comes from water. So this type of Tawriya, we have seen it many times in the seerah uh, of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, notice as well, I mean, subhanAllah, the bravery of the Prophet to act as a scout. Scouts are the most dangerous because there is no army to protect. Anybody can see, and he is the Prophet ﷺ, like literally the most important person. But it's also the sensitivity. The sensitivity of the situation. So, the Prophet ﷺ comes back uh, and he does not tell the army anything yet. And the first thing he does, he goes and he stands in salah, asking Allah for help. Because now he himself is getting tense. What is to be done? And this is again a natural tension. Nothing wrong with that. He himself is tense. Now what is to be done? And as he is praying, as he is praying, there is a commotion that begins. What is this commotion? The Sahaba have captured two of the slaves from the Quraysh. And they are asking them, where are you from? And they said, we are from the army of the Quraysh. We are from the, the army that we just left a few days ago when we came to defend the caravan. And they began beating up the slaves, the Sahaba, saying, no, you're lying. You're not from the army. You're from the caravan of Abu Sufyan. Notice, they themselves are so eager that what they're going to meet up is not the army, but the caravan. They're throwing their own projections onto these slaves. And they began beating the slaves, saying, No, tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. You're from the caravan, aren't you? And they continued beating until finally they said, Yes, we're from the caravan. From the caravan. Then, after a while, they asked again. And they said, No, we're from the army. So they beat them again. Until finally they said, No, no, we're from the caravan. From the caravan. When the Prophet finished his salah, notice how long is his salah as well, subhanAllah. He's just praying a long salah. When the Prophet finishes his salah, notice the simplicity and yet the profundity. That he says to the Sahaba, when they tell you the truth, you beat them. And when, when they lie, you let them go. I mean, how, how foolish is that? That they've t they're telling you the truth. You cannot swallow that information. And so you're beating them even though they're telling you the truth, which is we're from the army of the, the Quraysh, right? And when they're lying to you, and they finally say we're from the caravan, from the caravan, that is when, uh, you know, you let them go. And this shows us that, uh, subhanAllah, it's as if the Prophet is saying, it's ridiculous to torture them. They'll tell you anything under torture, right? What, what's the point of beating them? What's the point of torturing them? Whatever you want them to say, they're going to say it when you're going to beat them. So this is the beauty, the profundity, the process that he's telling them, look, they're telling you the truth, they have nothing to gain. They're not, they're, they're, they're from the army of the Quraysh, I mean, they're slaves, but they're not a part of the army. They're, they're just workers in the army. They're just, you know, cooks and, and, and cleaners and whatnot. They're telling you the truth and accept them at face value. And of course, this was the final, if you like, verdict now. That khalas, we are not meeting the caravan. We are meeting the army. Okay, this was a very... Uh, difficult and emotional time now for the Sahaba now. That this was the test. That the caravan is now officially, now the Prophet has told them that no, this is now, they are true in what they say. They are saying they are with the army and they are not with the uh, caravan. And then the Prophet came up to them to ask them questions. And he says, tell me, how many people are in the army? So he wants to find out. How many people are in the army? And they said, we are slaves, we are just water carriers, we don't know these things. And they are illiterate, they're uneducated, we don't know anything. We, we don't know how many you know, uh, people are in the army. And uh, again, the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, so you are workers, you are slaves. Tell me, how many camels do they kill every day? So now this is their job. Notice, subhanAllah, you know, the 
the the the, the deepness, the profundity. Like the 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 the, the, the slaves are right. Like how do you expect us? We don't count to a, a thousand. We don't know. So the process and asked them a question they would know. Okay, you're the cooks and cleaners. How many camels do you kill a day? So they said nine or ten. So the process immediately said they are between nine hundred to a thousand. Look at, again, the Sahaba are not able to get this information. Two questions, and immediately the Prophet has the information that uh, he needs from these, uh, these slaves there. So they're around between uh, 900 to 1,000 uh, people, because one camel would on average be able to feed 100 uh, people. And he said, who is present amongst them from their noblemen? And thus began a who's who of the Quraysh. Right? This is the whole point of Badr that we don't really, many of us don't understand. Wallahi, every single major henchman of the Quraysh is eliminated at Badr. This is really the beauty of Badr. Everyone whose names we've mentioned and, and were, are worthy of being criticized and smeared, everyone to a last man. It was a, a victory upon a victory. Every one of these men. And so they began mentioning Umayya ibn Khalaf, Shayba ibn Rabi'a, Utbah ibn Rabi'a, uh, Suhail ibn Amr, Abu Jahl. All of these people are mentioned and they're all the noblemen. They're all the noblemen. And this news caused the Muslims to be very disheartened. Why? Because the whole gathering has come. All of the noblemen. And if they, and if they are here, this means their wealth is here too. This means they must have paid a lot of people. This means they have the best armor. This may, And they did have the best camels and the best armor. A lot of these cowards purchased the best camels. Right? So, this demoralized many of the Muslims. And again, this shows us the humanity of the Sahaba. I mean, wallahi, they were demoralized. We would have turned around and read, fled, fled. You know? This demoralized the Sahaba. But the Prophet ﷺ smiled in happiness. Why? Because he knew Allah's promise is true. And Allah had said, whichever of the two you meet, will be yours. That's what the Quran says, right? وَإِذْ يَعِدُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَ الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ أَنَّهَا لَكُمْ Allah had said, you're gonna meet one of the two, whichever one you meet, it will be yours. وَتَوَدُّونَ أَنَّ غَيْرَ ذَاتِ الشَّوْكَةِ You wanted the one that had no weapons. You wanted the caravan. But Allah wanted something bigger than this. So when it was now confirmed that the, they are facing the army, and the Prophet ﷺ hears that the army has all of these elite people, he is happy. Why? Because he trusts Allah's promise that Allah has said, this will be yours. And so he told the uh, Muslims that, uh, look, Mecca has presented to you uh, the uh, Arabic expression is Falakul Akbal, which basically means the creme de la creme, right? It has given you its, what are you, what are you going to say, the liver of its what? I mean, yani the expression is, huh? You can't translate this, yani, doesn't it? Yani. But yeah, the, the cream of the crop. In, in English, we have our own way, right? So, huh? It, it, it's given to you the, the, the bounty, it's given to you the cream of the crop, right? Uh, it's given to you the apple of its eyes, it's given to you the best that it has. Mecca has given to you, offered on a plate, basically. It has given to you the best that it has. And when he saw the look of like uh, dejection in their faces, he said that wallahi, by Allah, Umayyah will be killed over here. And Shayba will be killed over here. And Utbah will be killed over here. And Abu Jahl will be killed over here. And he pointed to them every single location. That literally the next day when it happened, or two days from now as we'll get to when it happened, every single person was found on the very spot that the Prophet had pointed out. That he's trying to make them feel uh, a sense of ease and at peace. And now that the Muslims realize that they're facing an army and not a caravan, now the Prophet needed to rile up the troops. He needed to rile up the troops. And this shows us, yes, there's a lot of fear, but when push came to shove, they passed the test. Right? There was a lot, and Allah Himself mentions it, that you were arguing with the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the difference between Iman and Kufr, Iman and Nifaq. That yes, Iman might feel hesitant, but in the end, it will win in the day. And so the Prophet ﷺ called the gathering of all of the Sahaba, and uh, he uh, told them that, you know the situation as it is, uh, what do you think we should do now. What do you think we should do now? Now obviously there is really no choice. I mean, you know, th there is no choice. The army has come. 
if they were to go back to Medina, this is like the worst humiliation. This is like not even meeting them in battle. And if they meet them in battle, then it's a very difficult victory. It's a very difficult uh, situation. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you think needs to be done? This is not the first time, nor, nor will it be the last that we will see shura in action. Shura in action. Yadullahi ala al-jama'ah. That Allah's hand is upon the majority or the, or the group. And there is no question that uh, consultation, shura, is a praiseworthy element of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ had no need of shura, but he demonstrated shura for all of us. He doesn't need shura. He is Rasulullah ﷺ. But he's demonstrating what any leader should do. He's demonstrating that the leader needs to have the people behind him. Also, even if he is Rasulullah the best way to moralize the, 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 the troops is to have them involved in the decision making as well. Right? And so he says, what do you think we should do? Immediately Abu Bakr, of course Abu Bakr stands up, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sends salat upon the Prophet and then says, Ya Rasulullah, do as you please, we are behind you. It's your decision. Right? Sat sits down. The Prophet thanked him and praised him. Then he asked again, what do you think we should do? Silence. Umar stands up. And Umar says, Ya Rasulullah, do as you please, for verily, we will do anything you want us to do. He sits down. The Prophet then praises him. Then he says, for the third time, what do you think we should do? Silence again, because what does he want? So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr, another the Muhajirun, stand up, st st stood up. And Al-Miqdad probably thought that maybe Abu Bakr and Umar weren't forceful enough. Let me go and add some, some rhetoric. Let me add some fiery language here. So Al-Miqdad ibn Amr said and said, Ya Rasulullah, do as Allah has commanded you to do, and we are right behind you. Ya Rasulullah, we will not say to you, as the Bani Israel said to their Prophet Musa, "Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila inna ha huna qaidun." You all know the story in the Quran that when they're going to meet the big giants, right? The Bani Israel said to the to Musa, "Look, man, you and your your God go and fight. We're not going to go fight those people, right?" We're not going to say that the uh, Al-Miqdad said. Rather, we will say, you and your Lord, you go fight and we are right behind you fighting. Right? And then he said, Ya Rasulullah, go and take us to Barak al-Ghimad. Barak al-Ghimad is again an expression. Take us to the corner of the world. This is an English word say. Barak al-Ghimad is just an expression. Take us to the corner of the world and we will follow you uh, until we meet what Allah's decree has destined for us. Now, it's basically the same thing is being said except that Al-Miqdad it's a bit more eloquent. You can't get more eloquent than this. Now he sits down, thinks, khalas. This is what the Prophet wanted to hear. The Prophet thanked him. Then for the fourth time said, what do you think we should do? Why? Because the Ansar, this is now the crucial factor. Abu Bakr is Qurashi. Umar is Qurashi. Miqdad is Qurashi. And the Ansar, remember from the covenant of Bay'at al-Aqaba, Go back there now. The Ansar had promised the Prophet ﷺ that they would, the phrase is, protect him as they would protect their own families. Badr is not protection. Badr is offensive. Badr is not protection. They can go back to Medina now. Khalas. The Ansar had not signed up for this. The condition for the Ansar was if we are attacked, in Medina, then you will protect me as you will to the max. As you will protect your own family and children, you will protect us. That's all we want from you, right? That was the condition. And so now for the first time, the Ansar are being asked in a very gentle manner. And notice the Prophet didn't even put them on the spot. Three times, and three times Quraysh stand up. And the Quraysh are indeed, as al al No, we expect the Quraysh to stand up. Three times the Quraysh stand up. And the Ansar are quiet. Now, for the fourth time, they realize there's something deeper than this, right? And so, that great leader of the Ansar, the greatest leader of the Ansar, that leader whom when he eventually died a shaheed, the Prophet ﷺ said, the throne of Allah shook at the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Now we know why the throne of Allah shook. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, that young man, that, that eloquent, that powerful man, who was going to be their leader had he lived. lived. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh came after the battle of Khandaq, and he was wounded, and he was dying, but they didn't know he was dying. That was his death wound. Uh, they thought he would live. He was wounded he came on his donkey and the Prophet ﷺ said to the Ansar stand up to meet your leader 
Stand up, show some respect. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. That the Prophet is telling the Ansar, stand up, have show some show some respect to your leader. And by the way, standing up for leaders is a whole fiqh issue. About should you, should you not? And this hadith clearly shows us that it is allowed on occasion. It is allowed. And as for the fiqh, Imam Nawi and others talk about it. Anyway, this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. So then he stood up and he said, Perhaps you're waiting for us, Ya Rasulullah. I.e., is that why you're asking four times? Perhaps you intend us, لَعَلَّكَ تَقْصِدُنَا Perhaps you're waiting for our response. And so the Prophet ﷺ finally admitted, he said, Naam, yes, I need to hear from you. What is your response as the Ansar? And so Sa'ad gave that eloquent speech, which when you translate it, destroys all of the eloquence, but it is a powerful, a rousing speech. And he says in it that, Ya Rasulullah, amanna bika wa saddaqnaak. After all, we believed in you, and we trusted you, and we testified that what you have come with is the truth. And we have given you our uhud and mithaq, our promises and our oaths, that we will listen and obey you. Notice the beauty of Sa'ad here. He doesn't go back to the bare minimum. We gave you a promise to protect you. Rather, he mentions the other phrase. We will obey you, Ya Rasulullah. Right? Look at this Iman now. He's going now to the spirit of the law, not to the letter. If he wanted to go down to the letter of the law, he could say, look, you know, there's an exemption. We didn't sign up for this. You know, if he wanted to. But he's looking at the spirit of Islam. He's saying, Ya Rasulullah, after all, are we not Muslims? Didn't we believe in you? Didn't we trust you? Didn't we do everything you want us to do? So now, Ya Rasulullah, go forth and do as you see fit and we are with you. For I swear by the one who has sent you with the truth, were you to, were you to take us into the ocean and charge us galloping into the ocean. These are people who cannot swim by the way, right? These are, these are Bedouins, these are desert dwellers, they don't know how to swim. Were you to charge us into the ocean, then we would go right behind you. We are not scared of meeting the enemy tomorrow and we will show you our patience during battle and insha'Allah or la'allallah, which is basically insha'Allah, Allah will show you through us that which will comfort you, i.e. You will see our bravery, our sincerity, our truthfulness. So go forth ala barakatillah. Famdi ala barakatillah. Go forth upon the blessings of Allah. We are right behind you. And when Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad said this, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, his face became like the shining moon. Like he was so happy to hear the Ansar were behind him. And this reinvigorated him. And uh, he reiterated what he had said before that Wallahi Allah has promised me one of the two and it is this one and every one of them will that I have mentioned because he had mentioned them every one of them will die tomorrow every one of these that I have mentioned will die uh, tomorrow and having said this he then began the actual preparations for war and we have come right to the end of our uh, halaqa for today shall the next Wednesday we'll continue about the preparation in the side of the Prophet system and also what happened in the side of the uh, Quraysh. We have a few minutes for Q&A and then we have two, three announcements to make before uh, Salat al-Isha. So questions about today's? Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, it was a good talk, so whichever camera he made will have a success. If that, was that revealed when he was praying after he came back? Or? So the question is, when was the verse revealed that Allah has promised you one of the two caravans? The response is, we don't know exactly when, but we can assume from the context of the verse that it was revealed when the first rumors had come that there is an army coming. So when the Prophet left Medina, he had no clue, he had no idea that he's actually going to meet the army and that's why he tells the Muslims that we're out to meet the caravan and inshallah Allah will bless you with a great victory which was true Allah did bless them with a great victory right but he thought it was the caravan then in between this caravan news and this incident now when the rumors began to come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised him you will meet a group one of the two either the caravan or the army and you will be victorious in whichever one that you meet during the no, Surah Al-Anfar was revealed after Badr. But it explains Badr. Who became the leaders of Makkah after Badr? Of, uh, Abu Sufyan. Who became the leader of Makkah after Badr? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan became 
uh, the, the Abu Sufyan was relatively younger. He was uh, he could not have been leader had it not been for the death of all of the seniors. So he sucked up into the vacuum, and so Abu Sufyan became the leader. And that is why in the Fatih Mecca, the Prophet said, "Man dakhla bayta Abu Sufyan fahuwa amin." He mentioned one person by name. That Abu Sufyan is the only one of the old guard of that level of that tabaqa. Right? No, nah, they had Suhaid ibn Amr and they had others, but not to the level of Abu Sufyan. Right? Again, these are levels of, uh, uh, of people. And Abu Sufyan was, uh, like you can see here right now, for example, Abu Sufyan is the leader of the caravan, Abu Jahl is the leader of the army. So already you find yani, that they are at somewhat of a similar level. So the main person of Mecca became Abu Sufyan, and that is why in the Battle of Uhud, Abu Sufyan was at the head of the army. Surah Al Anfal was revealed after Badr. But it explains Badr. Immediately after Badr. Immediately after Badr. And it explains Badr. And that is why, inshallah, I hope, inshallah, when we finish Badr, we'll actually pause to do a quick tafsir of Surah Anfal, just one halaqa, inshallah. Maybe even just the verses related to Badr. So that next time we read Surah Anfal, it will be very fresh in our memories. Because, subhanAllah, every one of these incidents is linked to an ayah of Anfal. So it's very beneficial to know Surah Anfal. Yes? You commented on the, uh, the two slaves that they caught by the Muslims and they got tortured. It seems the Prophet did not comment on the torture itself. So something relevant to the modern, uh, like, uh, international politics. What, what torture, the torture from, from the Turkey standpoint in order to obtain information is that What's your comment on that? This one? It's a very difficult question. I, I understand. So the, the brother is asking about, so the, 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 the two slaves were beaten and in our terminology would call. Now, when we say torture, they were not like sliced. They weren't like, you know, I mean, they were just like slapped with shoes or whatever, you know, I mean, that type of, that type of stuff. You know, just a little bit of, we would say roughing up. You know, they weren't like cooked over a fire like the Chinese torture or something. You know, it's like this is not so. Firstly, I mean, I'm not and he's saying that even this is just an art. I'm just saying, let us be careful. This term torture has a connotation that perhaps that's why I didn't choose the term torture. I use the term beat, right? Darabuhum, yani rough them up, slap them up, right? Um, this is a very difficult question, and there is a, uh, a very simple response to this, and that is that, in my humble opinion, the Sharia has revealed a basic framework that allows for adaptations, right? And there is no doubt that at another time and place and world environment, certain things would have been allowed that our political, uh, uh, you know, uh, treaties and whatnot do not allow in our times. So, the Sharia came and raised the bar immensely. For example, you had to feed prisoners of war, you couldn't starve them to death. You had to give them a minimal amount of housing and whatnot. This was not known before the coming of Islam, right? In the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, and we'll come to this, he said, feed them with what you feed uh, yourself. And so the prisoners were treated better than the people who were hosting them, right? Because when the Prophet ﷺ said, feed them with your feed yourself, so then the meat was given to the prisoner. Just in case somebody would be accused that you took the meat, you didn't give it. So the Sahabi literally picked his meat up and put it in front of the, the prisoner. The prisoner felt embarrassed that you're giving me the meat. He quietly put it back in front of the Sahabi. The Sahabi said, no, this is yours. right? So the Islam came and no doubt it changed a lot of things. And yet it, it didn't uh, you know, do maybe what uh, some other later treaties did to show that there is a spectrum. right? So in our times, if certain elements of certain treaties go more than what Islam did, once the country signs agreement to these treaties, there's no problem in saying, okay, you know what, we will also raise it to this level, right? So what I'm saying is, uh, it is there's nothing wrong at all in any Muslim nation or country signing on to these international treaties and then upholding their level and condition. And as for the incidents in the seerah that seem to go against modern uh, conventions and whatnot, I think honestly it is very intellectually shallow for any serious academic to challenge uh, them because they, what, you need to compare what the Prophet and Sahaba did with what others did at his time and place. Right? You need to be relative that when Europe was doing this, when China was doing this, this is what the Muslims were doing. 
right? Now, if, let's say, uh, the treaties have, you know, uh, done certain things in modern times, then, okay, not a problem for us to hold up to them. And also, we do need to be very clear here and point out that, look, even you guys have not upheld your own treaties in a million and one exceptions all related to Islam and Muslims. So don't come preaching to us about, uh, you know, Hum, uh, you know, uh, uh, human rights and whatnot. When you know we still have Guantanamo and we still have this, we still have the. Where does we? Where do we even begin the list? Okay, don't come preaching to us when you yourselves clearly don't have uh, a stellar record. So uh, it's a t difficult question, but again, I don't see any major problem in responding in this matter. Uh, sisters, any questions before we? Uh